Hello, citizens of internet. I am Professor Ajit Verkud from Mumbai, India. Today I am going to discuss Vulvo Vaginal Candidiasis, VVC. It is also known as monoleal vulvo vaginitis. It is one of the most prevalent and obstinate forms of vaginitis. Vulvo vaginal candidiasis is the second most common cause of vaginitis symptoms, after bacterial vaginosis, and accounts for approximately one third of vaginitis cases. Vulvo vaginal candidiasis is not traditionally considered a sexually transmitted disease, since it occurs in celibate women too. I will elaborate on this later. So please, stick on, till the end of the lecture. One more thing, of the three commonest types of vaginitis, vulvovaginal candidiasis has the highest risk of multiple recurrences, despite treatment. The prevalence of vulvovaginal candidiasis is difficult to determine because Conjuda species, without inflammation, can be identified in the lower genital tract in 10 to 20% of healthy women in the reproductive age group, 6 to 7% of menopausal women, and 3 to 6% of prepubertal girls. The widespread use of over-the-counter antifungal drugs makes epidemiologic studies difficult to perform. The clinical diagnosis is often based on symptoms and not confirmed by microscopic examination or culture. As many as one half of clinically diagnosed women may have another condition. Culture performed without clinical correlation is likely to overestimate the prevalence of disease. Yeast infections, which are caused by the overgrowth of congenital species, affect approximately 75% of women at least once in their lifetime. The incidence of a single or sporadic infection increases with age up to menopause. Prevalence is highest among women in their reproductive years. As woman's age advances, the risk of getting recurrent fungal infection increases. As is my trademark, I will first discuss basics. There are many different species of congeda fungi. Of these, the ones that cause opportunistic infection in human females are Congeda albicans, Congeda tropicalis, Congeda paracelosalis, Congeda glabrata, and Congeda crucae. Congeda albicans is responsible for 80 to 92% of episodes of vulvovaginal candidiasis and in Congeda glabrata accounts for almost all of the remainder. Congeda glabrata is more commonly associated with septicemia. Possibly due to widespread use of over-the-counter drugs, long-term use of suppressive azoles, and the use of short courses of antifungal drugs, some investigators have reported an increasing frequency of non-albican species, particularly Congeda glabrata. Congeda albicans, the commonest species seen, is a dimorphic fungus occurring in a yeast form, as blastospores, and in filamentous forms, as hyphae and pseudohyphae. Adherence to epithelial cells of vaginal mucosa, is necessary for invasive disease, and congeda albicans has the highest adherence rate of all the yeasts. This is why they are seen most frequently in vulvovaginal candidiasis. Congeda albicans exists in different morphological forms, also called phenotypes. 1. Yeast, seen as blastospores, 2. Pseudohyphae and 3. True hyphae. Please note these are called transforms, because they can change from one form to another. This is called phenotypic switching or dimorphism which is a characteristic feature of congeda albicans which helps it profoundly, in causing infection and recurrence. Pseudohyphae indicates active infection. This is a diagrammatic representation of the same. Hyphae is more important for causing infection. Congeda infection can occur in different parts of human body. Mucosal candidiasis, oral thrush, oropharyngeal candidiasis, congeda vulvovaginitis and balanitis, which is infection of penis. Cutaneous candidiasis, paronychia, onychomycosis, diaper candidiasis, perianal candidiasis and inner trigo. Invasive candidiasis, urinary tract infection, pulmonary candidiasis, arthritis, osteomyelitis, septicemia, meningitis, nosocomial, that is hospital-acquired, candidiasis, ocular candidiasis, 
and hepatosplenic candidiasis. Allergic candidiasis, vesicular lesions in web spaces, gastritis, irritable bowel syndrome and eczema. It is important to remember that, conjuda species are considered part of the normal vaginal flora. They live on, and not in, vaginal epithelium and rectal epithelium. Symptomatic disease is associated with an overgrowth of the organism and penetration of superficial epithelial cells. The mechanism by which conjuda species transform from asymptomatic colonization to an invasive form, causing symptomatic vulvovaginal disease is complex, involving host inflammatory responses and yeast virulence factors. The stages of symptomatic fungal infection are Colonization characterized by epithelial adhesion and nutrient acquisition. Superficial infection involves epithelial penetration and degradation of host protein. Next, it leads to deep-seated infection, characterized by tissue penetration, vascular invasion, and immune evasion or escape. In a few cases this can worsen into disseminated infection involving endothelial adhesion, infection of other host tissues and activation of coagulation and blood clotting cascades, Is candidiasis a sexually transmitted infection? Although vulvovaginal candidiasis is not a sexually transmitted infection, I will go as far as to say, boldly, that it is a sexually associated infection. I will explain, what I mean by that. Vulvovaginal candidiasis is not traditionally considered a sexually transmitted disease since it occurs in celibate women. This does not mean that sexual transmission of conjuda does not occur or that vulvovaginal candidiasis is not associated with sexual activity. An increased frequency of vulvovaginal candidiasis has been reported at the time when most women begin regular sexual activity. Partners of infected women are four times more likely to be colonized than partners of uninfected women, and colonization is often the same strain in both partners. However, the number of episodes of vulvovaginal candidiasis a woman experiences does not appear to be related to her lifetime number of sexual partners or the frequency of coitus. Women who exclusively have sex with women do not appear to have an increased risk of vulvovaginal infection. The type of sex may be a factor. Infection may be linked to orogenital sex and, less commonly, anogenital sex. Predisposing causes for vulvovaginal candidiasis are Physiological states, infancy, pregnancy, due to decreased glucose tolerance, and old age Low immunity states caused by prolonged treatment with broad-spectrum antibiotics, steroids, anti-trichominal agents, HIV, use of immunosuppressive agents, malignancy etc. Oral pills the role of modern low estrogen pills as a predisposing cause is disputed. Endocrine diseases such as diabetes, obesity, hypothyroidism, and hypoparathyroidism. Other diseases like Addison's disease, pancreatitis. Malnutrition, debilitation. Genetic predisposition, an association with polymorphisms in the Sieglet 15 gene which produces a cell surface protein has been reported in some women with recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis. Symptoms associated with vulvovaginal candidiasis are Intense pruritus vulvae, which is worse at night Thick, odorless discharge Superficial dyspareunia Burning, vulval discomfort and dysuria It is interesting to note that Pruritus vulvae is more predominant clinical feature of vulvovaginal candidiasis, as compared to other two types of vaginitis, where leucorrhea is a more common symptom. On local examination, vulva, appears smooth, shiny, swollen, red, congested and sore, evidence of scratching may be seen on perspeculum examination, discharge is typically thick, cheesy or cordy white and adherent, these white patches on vulva are called mycotic plaques. Vagina is edematous and tender. An important thing to remember is that cervix is not affected in vulvovaginal candidiasis. For office diagnosis of candidiasis by wet smear, 
10% potassium hydroxide, KOH, in saline is used to dissolve epithelial cells and debris. Unless vaginal epithelial cells are dissolved, colorless, non-modal hyphae and spores cannot be seen. Thin-walled yeast-like structures, 2 to 4 microns in size, budding cells, called conidia, are seen, spores may also be seen. If stained with gram stain, conjuda appears to be gram positive. One can see budding yeast with pseudohyphae. Use of Swartzlumpkin's fungal stain, that contains potassium hydroxide, a surfactant, and blue dye, may facilitate diagnosis by staining the conjuda organisms blue so they are easier to identify. Please note, microscopy is negative in up to 50% of patients with culture-confirmed vulvovaginal candidiasis. Conjuda glabrata is not easily recognized on microscopy because it does not form hyphae or pseudohyphae. Please note, vaginal pH will be normal in this infection, it is between 4.0 and 4.5. Culture is not typically required for routine diagnosis of vulvovaginal candidiasis, because vaginal pH and microscopy are reliable tests and because yeast are normal colonizers of the vagina, thus, a culture that confirms yeast may not reflect actual infection. Different culture media used for diagnosis are Saberod's dextrose agar medium will show creamy white, paste-like colonies. When cultured in Nickerson's medium, dark brown or black colonies, 1 to 2 mm in diameter, are seen. If cultured on chrome agar, the fungal colonies are light green in color. Pap smear is not useful for diagnosis of fungal vaginitis because pap smear is positive in only 25% of patients with culture positive, symptomatic vulvovaginal candidiasis patients. Pap smear is unreliable because the cells are mainly derived from the cervix, which is not affected by conjuda vaginitis. Germ tube test, GTT, is a special test that is done for identification of different species. This test is based on the ability of conjuda albicans to produce germ tubes, which are long, thin, hyphae-like structures that emerge from yeast cells under certain conditions. To perform the germ tube test, a small amount of conjuda albicans is added to a serum containing medium and incubated at 37 degrees centigrade for several hours. If the organism is capable of producing germ tubes, they will appear as elongated projections from the yeast cells. The presence of germ tubes is considered a positive result and indicates the likely presence of conjuda albicans. Positive germ tube test confirms presence of conjuda albicans species, other species, do not produce germ tubes. ELISA test for cell wall menon antigens or menon antibodies was done for diagnosis of conjuda infection, in the past. In modern gynecology, diagnosis of most vaginal infections should be confirmed by molecular tests. Polymerase chain reaction methods have high sensitivity and specificity and a shorter turnaround time than culture, but, are costly and offer no proven clinical benefit over culture in symptomatic women. A molecular test, BD-MAX, that assays the vaginal microbiome for evidence of bacterial vaginosis, vaginal candidiasis, and trichomonas, has shown promise in initial clinical studies, with a sensitivity for conjuda species group, of 90%, and specificity of 94.1%. Another test, approved by US FDA, is the Aptima cv tv one of the peculiar features of vulvovaginal candidiasis, which differentiates it from other types of vaginitis, is, its ability to recur multiple times in a year, despite appropriate treatment. Women who report having had three or more infections in a 12-month period are said to have recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis, RVVC. The management of such women is a challenge for most clinicians, however experienced they may be. As far as management goes, there are two types of vulvovaginal candidiasis. This table shows classification of conjuda infection. First type is, uncomplicated vulvovaginal candidiasis, its criteria include, 
sporadic, infrequent episodes, that is less than or equal to three episodes per year, mild to moderate signs and symptoms, infection with congeda albicans, healthy, non-pregnant, immunocompetent individual. Criteria for complicated vulvovaginal candidiasis include, severe signs and symptoms, congeda species other than congeda albicans, particularly congeda glabrata, pregnancy, poorly controlled diabetes, immunosuppression, debilitation, and history of recurrent culture verified vulvovaginal candidiasis. Before I talk about specific treatment of uncomplicated and complicated vulvovaginal candidiasis, let me discuss the general treatment which is equally important. General measures, which should be employed are Improve personal hygiene Give sits baths Treatment of predisposing factors such as control of diabetes, stop antibiotics, steroids etc. Wear cotton underwear or cotton crotch pantyhose Avoid use of low-temperature washing powders, vaginal sprays and deodorants and tampons. During sexual intercourse, use condom and lubricant like KY jelly to prevent mucocutaneous trauma. Specific, first-line treatment of fungal vaginitis is oral fluconazole, a single 150 mg tablet is given once. Different regimens are employed for treatment. These are termed induction therapy whose aim is to achieve clinical remission and negative vaginal cultures, that is complete eradication of yeast from vagina. These are Regimen 1, Tablet Fluconazole, 150 mg on Day 1 and Day 4 Or Regimen 2, Tablet Fluconazole, 150 mg on Days 1, 4 and 7 Regimen 3, Tablet Fluconazole, 150 mg from Day 1 to 5 I personally prefer, regimen 2, I call it the MTS regimen because I ask the patient to take tablets on Monday, Thursday, and Sunday. If there is induction therapy, then, there must be a maintenance therapy. Yes there is. Maintenance therapy is administered to suppress recurrent vaginal candidiasis, and is to be given subsequent to induction therapy. One tablet of fluconazole. 150 mg, is given every week for 6 months. At levels below minimal inhibitory concentration, MIC, antifungal effect persists in vaginal secretions for 7 days. This is the rationale for weekly treatment. Different antifungal agents, that can be administered vaginally, instead of orally, are, natamycin vaginal pessaries, 1 at night for 8 days. Myconazole nitrate, 2%, one application of 5 grams of cream intravaginally and to labia every day for 7 to 14 days. Turconazole or cetraconazole cream can also be applied locally. In obstinate infections, when no antifungal agents work, other, so-called colloquial treatments can be tried with great success. One effective agent is gentian violet. 1% aqueous solution can be applied locally to vulva and vagina for 10 to 14 days. The only drawback of this treatment is that, it is very messy, it stains the undergarments. <music> 600 mg of boric acid in a gelatin capsule can be administered vaginally twice daily for 14 days. Boric acid must be given in a gelatin capsule because it is classified as a poison and may be absorbed systemically through the vaginal mucosa. Please note, boric acid capsules can be fatal if swallowed. Treatment of complicated candidiasis is as follows. There are two options. Option 1, for severe vaginitis symptoms, give oral fluconazole. 150 mg every 72 hours for 2 or 3 doses, depending on severity. Or Option 2. Topical Azole Antifungal Therapy, daily for 7 to 14 days. A low-potency topical corticosteroid can be applied to the vulva for 48 hours to relieve symptoms until the antifungal drug exerts its effect. Treatment of recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis is as follows. Induction with fluconazole 150 mg every 72 hours for 3 doses, 
followed by maintenance fluconazole 150 mg once per week for 6 months. If fluconazole is not feasible, other options include 10 to 14 days therapy of atopical azole or alternate oral azole, for example itraconazole, followed by topical maintenance therapy for 6 months, clotrimazole 200 mg, 10 grams of 2%, vaginal cream twice weekly or 500 mg vaginal suppository once weekly. Treatment of vulvovaginal candidiasis in pregnancy involves topical application of clotrimazole or myconazole cream for 7 days. Oral fluconazole must be avoided. For treatment of disseminated fungal infection, amphotericin B is used. I won't go into further details because gynecologists don't handle these cases. What about treatment of non-albicans congeda vaginitis, whose incidence is on the rise? Well, treatment depends upon species identified. For congeda glabrata treatment, boric acid 600 mg capsule can be given intravaginally daily for 14 days. If failure occurs, 16% topical flucytosine cream, 5 g nightly is used for 14 days. Treatment of congeda cruce requires intravaginal clotrimazole, myconazole, or triconazole for 7 to 14 days. For all other species, conventional dose fluconazole, 150 mg, should work. Otoseconazole is an azole antifungal drug for use in individuals with recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis that is more potent against congeda species, including congeda glabrata, compared with fluconazole. The drug is contraindicated in those who have the ability to become pregnant, are pregnant, or are lactating. Concerns for embryo-fetal toxicity are based on rat studies that reported retinal abnormalities in offspring and because of the long half-life, 138 days, of the drug. Otoseconazole should be taken with food to aid absorption. Single drug regimen, otoseconazole 600 mg orally on day 1, otoseconazole 450 mg orally on day 2, and, starting on day 14, otoseconazole 150 mg orally once a week for 11 weeks, that is, once a week dosing during weeks 2 through 12. The dual drug regimen involves initial treatment of the acute infection with fluconazole, 150 mg orally given on days 1, 4, and 7, followed by suppressive therapy with otoseconazole, 150 mg orally once a day for 7 days on days 14 through 20, followed by otoseconazole 150 mg orally once a week. If you want to know more about this, or any other topic in obstetrics and gynecology, Please refer to my textbooks Modern Obstetrics, Modern Gynecology and my flagship book Practical Obstetrics and Gynecology. For purchase inquiries, please message me on this WhatsApp number. They are also available on Amazon.in. I have also published, two small question-answer books which are particularly popular with undergraduate and postgraduate examination going students. These are clinical cases in obstetrics 1000 plus questions and answers and clinical cases in gynecology 1000 plus questions and answers. These are also available on amazon.in. You can follow me on other social media platforms like Facebook or Meta and Instagram. Also read my blog on blogspot.com. Their links are given here. If you enjoyed this video and found it useful, hit the like button below, share it with friends and colleagues and also subscribe to my channel for more videos like this. You can also help me grow, by clicking on the thanks button below.